you're welcome to the sixth edition of the Yoruba Historical Conversation. Thank you for joining us. This is Don Commission, as we all know. Don Commission means um, Development Agenda for Western Nigeria. For put a hearing of Don Commission for the first time, Don is the regional um, platform which the governments of the Southwest set up to think, to think through issues of development, issues of regional integration for them. As we know that the region as it is right now, there are six states that work individually. Each governor thinks of issues that has to do with their state. We can't expect the governor of Lagos to be thinking for Ikiti. We can't expect the governor of um, Ondo to be thinking for Oyo. So that's why we have done commission to think for them on how they can work together, on how they can develop together. We don't want a situation where we have only Lagos developing and other states are coming behind. We want a situation whereby our region is an example to other regions in the, in the nation. We want our region to be the place where you can, if you're thinking of where to invest, we want the Southwest region to be the first place on your mind. If you're thinking of where to work, we want the Southwest region to be the first place on your mind. If you want to visit, you want to go on holiday, on tourism, we want the Southwest to be the first place on your mind as a, as a Nigerian and even as a member of the universe. So that is what Don Commission is set up to do. So you're very welcome and I hope that you enjoy the conversation today. Thank you. Um, I'd like to call on the Acting Director General of Don Commission to take the opening remarks and to set the tone for this occasion. Thank you. Can we put a, give him a round of applause as he comes on? Thank you, um, Tosi. Um, good morning once again. Um, you're welcome to Dawn, as um, she has aptly described. This is the regional integration vehicle for the southwest part of Nigeria, or western Nigeria, whichever way you want to call it. And this is Cocoa House. There's no better building to host a regional organization for the Southwest than Cocoa House. The building is um, 51 or 52 years old this year, still standing. Was, um, this is the brainchild of the Aulawas and the Akitolas of those days. And it is still standing. The, we argue here that um, our best period as a people was during that generation. And it's a shame to keep saying that your best period was in the past. Anyway, the commission was set up to try and recreate and reenact what happened in the past, pick out the best practices and see how we can adapt it for our future generation. Part of that is our culture, which we've lost, our values, and as um, a step forward in bringing back our history, our culture, this idea of Yoruba historical conversation was conceived last year, a year ago to, I think a year ago tomorrow. And um, as she rightly said, this is the sixth edition. Um, we've brought people like uh, Professor Bolali Awe, Banjia Kitoye, Shinyo Yoweso, uh, Jideo Shutoku, Professor Adelola Adele, the foremost uh, neurosurgeon in Africa, to come and tell us about who we were in the past, that we were once proud people, and as Yorubas, we should not be ashamed to say that we are Yorubas. Um, we are at a point in our history where even our kids at times are afraid outside to say, oh, I'm Yoruba. But we should be proud of our Yorubaness, if there's a word like that. And in bringing out this series of Yoruba historical conversation, we're telling us that we used to be a proud race. It's a shame that today we have to, uh, I say that all the time, we have to go to Abuja before we can feed. It never used to happen. This money was not Abuja money. To, the money that was used to build this edifice didn't come from Abuja. It came from southwest, from western Nigeria of those days. We can go back to that era. As I said, we were once proud people. 
what we have today, we, we are akin to the Almagiris. Every month, our commissioners of finance will head to Abuja and stretch for their hands, give us money for us to eat. But in doing this, in having a commission like this, we, as she has rightly said, we are thinking through that process of development, economic integration. And part of development is to make sure that your culture is, stays alive, that you understand your history. And that is why we are here today, that our culture will not die and that we will understand who we are. Once you understand your history and where you are coming from, believe me, you've solved half of your problem. But if you think you don't have an history, obviously you don't know where you're coming from, then you won't have a destination, you won't have a goal. So once again, we've brought in an eminent scholar to talk to us about another aspect of Yoruba. I can assure you that by the time you listen to him and he finishes, you will know that we've brought someone who understands the issues we are facing today as a people. Um, there are no um, hard and fast rules. He will talk. You have the opportunity of asking questions when he finishes. Uh, we're not going to waste his time because it's, we know he's traveling. He squeezed out this time for us, and we are very much appreciative of that. I won't be mentioning his name yet. Uh, my colleague will be doing a short citation. But once again, I want you to please enjoy this moment and take something away. It's, don't just listen and, oh, well, he said his own, let me go. No, take something concrete away. That in our own little corner as Yoruba, in our own little corner as people living in the southwest part of Nigeria, that we want to be proud again. We want to be proud again. We've lo uh, we, because of the work we do here, the facts are open to us. We used to say, oh, we are the leaders in education. We are the leaders in the banking sector. It's all a lie. We know now. We've lost out in several sectors. We've lost out as a people. I mean, I still talk to some older people and say, oh, uh, we Yoruba, we are the ones leading here, leading there. And I just laugh. That, bye bye, Mo. If only you know what we know. That we are nowhere. I mean, the other day, Nigeria played um, South Africa. I knew you. Not a single Yoruba man on the football pitch. That's even in sports. This is the region that produced the Mudoko Oshikoyas, the Nojim, Mayeguns. Oh, oh, where are we today? Nowhere. Recently, we had the vice president of Nigerian Football Association, here, Barista Sheyaki Ubi. And he was saying that even coaches, we don't have a Yoruba coach. I'm not afraid to say that. I'm a Yoruba man first, before a Nigerian. You can decide not to be a Nigerian tomorrow, but you can't decide not to be a Yoruba man. It's the fact. So once again, welcome to Dawn Commission, Development Agenda for Western Nigeria. Um, this is the first edition we'll be holding after we lost our Director General. So I'll crave your indulgence to please let's stand for a minute and silence before we start proceedings. Thank you. May the soul of Ola Dikpo Olushola Famakewa rest in peace. Thank you. I will now call on, because um, I don't want to waste, uh, there's a lot I can say, but I will call on um, one of my colleagues, Tayo Adeleke Adedui, to come and do a citation, and then we bring Prof to the podium. Tayo. Good morning, everyone. Once again, I'd like to welcome you all to um, Don Commission. But what I'm going to, what I normally do here is not a citation. It's far from that. I just try to, <laughs> I try to tell the story, you know, because Prof is a professor. If I see I'm doing a citation, am I, am I, am I properly, am I better do it properly before he scolds me? Um, he's a man of peace. When he came in here today, um, that's the first time it actually happened. Most of our guests they sit in the DG's office and they come here. But he came in here and he shook everybody's hands. 
He went around the whole office, he met everyone, and he, he shook our hands. You know, and for me, that, that meant a lot. Being called a man of peace and being actually a man of peace is different. I came in this morning with, with a lot of conflicts inside me. But when Prof shook my hands, <laughs> everything just seemed to vanish. <laughs> You're welcome, sir. Um, Isaac Olawale Albert, a Nigerian professor of African history, peace and conflict studies, and the pioneer director of the Institute of P for Peace and Strategic Studies, IPSS, University of Ibadu, Nigeria, was born on the 5th of August, 1959. Professor Albert has, had his primary school education at CAC Primary School, Wadata, and secondary education at Teligiado College in Makodi, Benue State, Nigeria. He took his higher school certificate at Elisha Grammar School before coming to the University of Ibadan in 1982 for a BA honors degree in history, which he completed in 1985. He did his MA and PhD degrees in African history at the University of Ibadan in 1992 and 1994, respectively. Um, well, Prof is from Elisha, and Elisha is known to be the home of the great warrior, um, so we are glad that the great peacemaker is also from <laughs> Elisha, so everything has balanced out. <laughs> in 1996, he initiated the academic link between the University of Ibadan and University of Ulster, Northern Ireland, which led to the commencement of the Peace and Conflict Studies Program of the University of Ibadan in 2000. He is a specialist in conflict analysis and process planning. He was the UNDP consultant for the establishment of the MA Peace and Development Studies course of the University of Cape Coast, Ghana in 2006. In 2007, he served as the country director of the Nigerian Office of the Institute of Democracy in South Africa. In 1999, he was invited by the United Nations International Leadership Academy, Amman Jordan, for a certificate course in peacekeeping and conflict resolution and subsequently trained in peace processes in the United Kingdom, United States, Germany, France, Belgium, Finland, Israel, Egypt, and South Africa. This peace gospel has gone global, as you can see. He joined the Institute of African Studies of the University of Ibadan as a junior research fellow in 1993 and rose through the ranks to become a full professor in 2006. He was a co-founder and a research associate to the Center for Research on Inequality and Human Security at the University of Oxford in the United Kingdom in 2003. Professor Albert was the pioneer director for the Center for Peace and Strategic Studies of the University of Ilorin in 2009. He was the director of the Institute of African Studies, University of Ibadan, from August 2010 to August 2013. He became the pioneer director of the University of Ibadan's Institute for Peace and Strategic Studies in September 2015. Professor Isaac Olawale Albert is the chairman of Mid Prodev's Board of Trustees and Professor of Peace and Conflict Studies. He's a specialist in conflict analysis, early warning monitoring, peace process planning, monitoring and evaluation, and also a conflict management trainer and professional mediator. In 2006, he won the Africa Peace Education Prize for California State University, Sacramento. He was a convener of the 2008 Extended Workshop on Social History, jointly sponsored by CEFIS, Netherlands, and the Council for the Development of Social Science Research in Africa, Codersia, on Historicizing Migration, St. Louis, Senegal, on the 3rd to 21st March 20, 2008. He is a member of several learned and professional associations, which include the International Society of Folk and Narrative Research in Finland, Ethnic Studies Network, Northern Ireland, Conflict Resolution Network, Chatswood, Australia, the International Association for Conflict Management, Minneapolis, USA, Nigerian Field Society, and African Association of Political Science. He is a member of the International Network to Promote the Rule of Law, a fellow and current board chairman of the Society for Peace Studies and Practice. He is a regional board member of the West African Network for Peace Building, Accra, Ghana, and associate member of Finnish Folklore Fellows. These are just a few things, or a few awards, or a few organizations that he is a member of. If you go on the internet, you will spend one hour still reading about his prizes, his achievements, and things he's done. He has served at various times 
as a consultant to the UNCHS, UNEAD, World Bank's Urban Management Program, USAID, DFID, Oxfam, IDASA, WANEP, US Africa Command, Frederick Herbert Foundation, National Defense College, Abuja, Command and Staff College, Jaji, Institute for Peace and Conflict Resolution, the Presidency, Abuja, Institute of Security Studies, and the Kofi Annan International Peacekeeping Training Center, Accra, Ghana. His areas of teaching or research interest include social history of Africa, African political economy, security studies and conflict resolution, gender studies, African oral traditions, and folklore. Professor Albert's scholarship, however, revolved around three key issues to which he strictly committed himself. The first is to promote the use of historical methods for studying peace and security issues. The second is to develop peace and security scholarship in Africa in the context of the continent mantra of African solutions to African problems. The third is to produce Afrocentric literature for promoting peace, peace scholarship in Africa. He is widely recognized as a security historian. Professor Albert has authored numerous publications, books, and technical papers. Albert Einstein posited that peace cannot be kept by force, but, only, but can only be achieved through understanding. Professor Albert has dedicated his life to identifying and analyzing violent and non-violent behaviors, as well as the structural mechanisms attending conflicts, including social conflicts, with a view towards understanding those processes which lead to a more desirable human condition. The Holy Books, Matthew chapter 5, verse 9 says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming a child of God and one in whom we can all find pride and of course peace. I present to you Professor Olawale Albert. Well, let me start by thanking you for that uh, rich Citation is the longest I've ever listened to. <laughs> it's the longest. Um, and when I listen to citations like this, I wonder what injustice I've done to myself. <laughs> because what is often declared is about, you know, as my age, it's not my age. I was in secondary school, uh, I think, from four. And I was to fill a document. I was asked to go to High Court. When I got to the High Court, the, the court asked me to produce somebody to serve as the person that will, will say my age. I mean, this was my first encounter. And as I came out of the court, I saw a young man who grew up beside my family compound, and he brought some prisoners. He brought some prisoners to the, to the court, and he offered to serve as my, as my father. He gave me the age, he gave me the date I'm using now. So we went before the, uh, and that has been my age since I, <laughs> I've been asked by my father to change it, but um, I don't see any reason why I should change it, it's my official date, but that is not my date of birth, it was given to me by a stranger, who didn't know when I was born, this is a conversation, so probably my, my own role is just to throw up the issues, and then we discuss. But I think we should discuss sincerely. Because the topic before us is a very, very important one. It's very it's strategically important. And important in the sense that Nigeria is sick. And we need to discuss the nature of the sickness. And we need to debate how the sickness will not affect us as individuals because if things continue the way they are um, they are most likely to kill this country and for those of us who are in the field of war studies we know that when nations are killed individuals are equally killed because I've met very very rich people at refugee camps 
finding it difficult to pay a bill of two dollars because when you are running away from a trouble spot you don't take your your resources along we are lucky that we have a better society now where all of us in our pockets we have ATM card but if you take your ATM card to some parts of the world it will not work because uh, the system might not recognize uh, your ATM card the topic sent to me by Don is rethinking Yoruba unity in an era of alternative history so the dominant issue is unity what do we mean by unity and why do we need to be discussing unity at this level uh, unity has to do with bringing people together with a view to achieving a common objective and while concluding this presentation I will call attention to four aspects of unity the first aspect is that the people must be together so you must be together and being together could be a question of physical presence I mean all of you are in the same assembly but there is also the cosmic aspect of being together you are together in the spirit you are together as a people then the group must think together the group must act together and then the group must collectively bear the consequences of their actions now what we want to ask ourselves is are Yoruba people together do they think together do they act together are they prepared for bearing the consequences of their actions together so these are questions that we would ask ourselves at the end of this presentation but I think the first core issue that we need to deal with is this concept of alternative history what is alternative history we cannot define alternative history until we understand what history is all about in our primary schools sec prim secondary schools you are provided what I would regard as a simplistic definition of history as it is often defined as the study of past events but as a better informed person I want to say history is not just the study of past events to me I think it's a reconstruction of past events it's a reconstruction of past events reconstruction in the sense that the past is there but we reconstruct the past in the context of the present challenges that we are facing and the DG has just reminded us here there was a time when Yoruba land had everything good industries education sports trade and what have you but he has just reminded us now that we are nowhere so if in the past we defined the Yoruba people as a very great people we are looking at the contemporary our contemporary situation to say the greatness is gone and so we're looking at the present to uh, redefine uh, to take you know uh, uh, to redefine our identity and I try here to present the case of President Goodluck Jonathan I'm still referring to alternative history when, Professor, uh, when President Goodluck Jonathan was coming to office he came as an Ijo person but later 
I don't think it's people who are responsible for this, but I think Igbo speaking people, they reminded us that it's a Bele Azikwe. It's an attempt to rewrite history. And that is what we call alternative history. And until that was properly done, that administration did not have the eagerness that was expected of it. And when that was presented to us and internalized by us, people started calling that administration not just only Niger Delta, but an Igbo administration. And many of us today, when we talk about that administration, we don't look at it as something that is uniquely Niger Delta, but uh, an Igbo administration. And therefore, when iPod members are throwing stones, you find some Nigerians saying, but you people have just left office. Who are the people that have just left office? Good Lord Jonathan. But Good Lord Jonathan redefined and repackaged as an Igbo person, not just an Igbo person. So that is what we call alternative history. Alternative history is when you try to look at, when you try to tamper with existing understanding of the past. Within that framework, some scholars have differentiated between actual history and alternative or alternate history. So that is to say there is something that is called actual history. And what is called actual history, I also want to call dominant history or mainstream history. Mainstream history, actual history is the history that is popular. But alternative history is the new history that is trying to act that is trying to challenge the orthodoxy, that is trying to challenge the existing knowledge. Now, my argument today is to say that we are in an era of alternative history. Is an environment in which people are redefining themselves as per the Nigerian state. And all groups are saying, who are we? And when you ask the question, who are we? If the existing knowledge does not present what you, want, what you want, then you go back and create your own history that will show who you are or who you want to be. And it is within this framework that we are saying today that Yoruba people need to ask themselves, who are you? Who are we? And then, when you ask the question, who are we? Do you really have the right kind of answers? Now, alternative history in, by some, you know, has been presented by some scholars as fictional history. Fictional in the sense that people say, well, you are just trying to create your own history and this history you have you are trying to create is not accepted it's not acceptable to us is a 419 history and um, in the process of this lecture I will call attention to the issues being raised by the Olubo of uh, Ubo who is now saying that East was the first Yoruba kingdom. Now, people are calling him names. But to me as a historian, he has the right to define his own people. But the question is that if you accept what he's saying, then several things will change in Yoruba land. Because what he's saying is that his own kingdom existed before Odudua. If you accept it, if you don't dismiss it as something fictional, then that means Odua investment is not important. Yoruba politics, which is tied to Odudua, is not important. Our claim that we have Yoruba people in the diaspora is not important. So, that is why we have several people actually uh, 
uh, arguing against what he is trying to say. So, under the present system in Nigeria, people are recasting history. They are, they are retelling the history of their of themselves in a matter in a manner that requires that we take a second look at ourselves. So as we're giving this lecture here in Ibadan, I expect the same type of lecture to be going on in Kaduna Kano or anywhere. I expect the same kind of lecture to be going on in the southeast, in the south south. Now we are saying that this issue should be addressed now because we cannot actually negotiate until we know who we are. If I'm invited tomorrow to come and you know to come to Abuja for a discussion on the relationship between Yoruba people and other Nigerians. If my brother Famorio shows up at the meeting, how do I know that he's a Yoruba man? And then, how do we sit down together to identify the interest of Yoruba people and factor those interests into the discussion? This is a very big, uh, it's a very big issue. But I think at the national level, we are also trying to create what one would call alternative history. Recently, some people came up with the, 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 the issue that the agreement with Ligard, I don't know who had that agreement with him, that, you know, some people are saying it is that the Nigerian state will dissolve after 100 years. They say it's a contract. But as a historian, I've been looking for that document. I cannot find it. <laughs> and so people have been saying that after 100 years, Nigerians can step back and say, okay, we want to go our different direction. But I'm telling you, some people will promote it as alternative history later. Because nobody is actually coming out to challenge that, that thesis. But my own problem is that I've not seen a document where it is written that we will be together for only 100 years. But I'm arguing here further that even if we have that agreement, if we have that document, it must have been a document prepared by one man. And who is that man? Lord Lugard himself. Because there was no consultation before Nigeria was established. So if we are expected to be together for 100 years, Lugard is the only person that would probably have written it in his personal diary. Of course, we are told in history that his wife, not even his wife, his girlfriend, was the one that named Nigeria. I don't know whether we are aware of it. He, she gave the name, a girlfriend that was visiting him. So, there was nowhere we sat down to even agree on the name. The man himself forgot to give us a name. But his visiting girlfriend said, it's Nigeria and then we are Nigeria. And that is why when anybody sit down on the wrong side of his room and say, Nigeria, is this, this is dissolved, I don't know the, he dissolved well, what do they call it? Indivisible. We, we are not actually being sincere with ourselves because what we have is a 419. So the structure itself is 419. And then you don't say 419 will survive forever. It's not possible. You need to redefine it. You need to discuss it. Similarly, we have... I discovered at the National Conference that what we call the 1999 Constitution, which some people tell you is sacrosanct, is uh, whatever, we were told at the National Conference openly that it was written by one man. And when we had tea break, I followed up that person, I said, was that one man? And he, made, he showed me the person. And the man laughed. The man laughed. He said, this is the person who wrote it. So, they called him, he wrote the constitution, taking care of his, the people, of his own people, and then we call it Nigerian constitution. And the first part of that constitution is talking about we the people. So, one man wrote a document and then started it with we the people. So, 
telling you that the constitution itself is another 419. It's not just the name of the country, but even the do document we say, no, you cannot, what you are doing is against the constitution of Nigeria. I think it will be humble or will be showing a high degree of humility to say what you are saying is against the wish of one man who wrote the constitution of Nigeria rather than saying uh, and then there is the increasing attempt now to create the impression I don't know whether it is misleading or valid the impression that the book came from Israel is 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 spreading very fast. It's, it's a form of alternative. It's a form of alternative history. You see people with all kinds of uh, rabbi kind of caps. You see people with all kinds of regalia. There was a time I was even we were even told that some people came from Israel. The result, the result of that. So it's a form of alternative history. But the question I ask myself is that yes, if it is established today that Igbo people came from Israel. How does it answer any of our national questions? Mm. Mm. To me, that is, that is an academic question I am asking myself. But when we come to the level of uh, Yoruba land, both the North and the South East consider the Yoruba people as the problem of Nigeria. You know, if, if, you, if you study what people are saying generally, and you bring them together, you can produce a scientific paper on Nigeria being, on the Yoruba being the problem of Nigeria. Sanusi made several statements on this. Yankasai made several statements on this. Ango Abdullahi made several you know, presentations on this. Yoruba being the problem of Nigeria. And I think this is part of what we need to discuss. Why should Yoruba people be the problem of Nigeria? Now, if these people are saying the Yoruba people, the Yoruba are the problems of Nigeria, to what extent are we actually looking at ourselves as a problem? Because most of the time, we present ourselves as the solution to the problem of Nigeria. Secondly, the Igbo people blame the civil war on Yoruba people. We are finished with the North now. And when you listen to them, they will tell you Yoruba people promised to go to war with them. Yoruba people didn't go to war. Ibo uh, Awolo was the person that recommended starvation and whatever. That creates a gulf between us and Igbo people. We don't work together politically for, for this. We produce a book on it which we were prevented from publishing. Because we need to look at this issue scientifically. But the book will eventually be published at the right time. When uh, Chimna Achebe wrote his, uh, uh, there was a country we wanted to pro release the book, but they said no, the time is not right yet. So, whereas Nonanans blame all the problems of Nigeria on Yoruba people, Igbo people also blame the problems of Nigeria on the Yoruba people. And recently, you have a very powerful anti-Yoruba rhetoric by Kano. And the latest I heard recently is that if you are an Igbo person, you are attending a Pentecostal church led by a Yoruba person. He did not say you are an imbecile. He said you are an imbecile. <laughs> you know, you listen to his programs. From time to time you see him remembering Yoruba people and calling names. And then the question is, for what? If you want to establish Biafra, or if, or if Igbo people want to leave Nigeria, why is it con you know, very convenient for everybody to just make reference to Yoruba people? We all know. Well, let me now say, I know as, a, you know as a scholar that the problem of federalism in Nigeria today is the not. So why are we afraid of actually naming where the problems are coming from? Why do you need to stigmatize a group and say that group is the problem? I find, and that is why I think the problems of Nigeria cannot be solved. Because when you are not shooting your arrows at the right target, you are just wasting your time. 
People will look at you, they will laugh, and you will remain with your problems for forever. Now, then, recently, Al Mustafa said, well, he's creating the impression. And I think that the full picture will come out as we move closer to the 2019 election. He's trying to create the impression that Yoruba leaders made it possible for Abiola to be killed. When you listen to some of the things that he's been saying, and I'm, I'm sure that when we get close to 2019, it will come out with that bomb, you know. And I think the agenda is to use, to use that to divide, to divide Yoruba land. But be waiting for it. It's coming very soon. So the impression is trying to create is that some Yoruba leaders worked against Abiola and, in fact, were instrumental to the death of Abiola. Now, all of these are aimed at rewriting history. They are aimed at rewriting history to say, once we sell this alternative history to you, you will discard anything you knew in the past, you will discard anything you accepted in the past, and then you begin to think differently. And where alternative history succeeds, you can have a child working against his father. I've seen, past I've seen pastors who told women or men that their spouses are their problems. And you see them acting accordingly. I've seen a boy who said his problem is the mother. A PhD student, not, not somebody who's not educated. He said, my mother is my problem. He said, but I don't want to kill her. This is because somebody told him that I've seen this vision that your mother doesn't want your progress. But I ask myself that how will you give birth to a child? Bring him to that level of almost completing PhD and then now you want to kill him. Personally, I find very difficult. But what we're trying to say is that if a dummy is sold to you and you accept it, it affects your perception of reality and then you begin to fight somebody who is supposed to be your friend. You begin to find somebody who is trying to be your friend. Now, we are going to have more alternative history being sold to us. And those who will buy these stories will buy them. But my conclusion here is that the more alternative histories you have, the more divided your society is. I looked at the history of Yoruba people from the 1860s. The Akintoyi and Kosoko conflict in Lagos, Dan, and uh, I came to the conclusion that we have always been having outsiders coming to sell the alternative history to us. But I call attention to just only one of them. And I call attention to them because this is not popular, it's not a popular knowledge in Yoruba land. The beaded crown disputes in Yoruba land. I have a whole book on it yet to be published. When the British signed their so-called agreement with Yoruba people in 1893 and started what is called indirect rule, they needed people who would serve the British government as colonial officials. And indirect rule says you rule through traditional rulers. But the British discovered that we have too many traditional rulers in Yoruba land. Now, which of them do you use? So, they decided to grade traditional rulers. A, B, C. And then they concluded that for our courts, for our political system, we are going to use only the grade A traditional rulers. And I, I'm sure they still have uh, first class or they are different names, they call them now. So, in 1903, the ONIF of IFE was asked to compile the names of Yoruba traditional rulers with the right to wear a beaded crown. So the British said, well, we are going to use only those with IFE beaded crown. And that is to say, 
we will use only the authentic traditional ruler. So, the only of you compiled the first list in 1903, but he updated the list later because for the first time it was realized that the only of FIFA himself did not have the kind of knowledge that the British uh, considered him to be. And even now, I think we have only just conferred authority on the only of FIFA. I don't think that uh, well, we will come to we will come to it later. We will come to it later. So he compiled us. He compiled the list, but even when the list was updated in 1906, several traditional rulers discovered that their names were not on the list. Now the so-called authentic traditional rulers then were those that got their their beaded crowns directly from Odudua, and those, the second layer, those who got their bidder crowns from those bidder crown traditional rulers. So, if I am a war of uh, Elisha, I mean, I got my traditional, I got my crown from Odudua. But if I give bidder crowns to some kings, they were also accommodated in the list. So, but there were several people who felt that their names were not on the list. And therefore they created what I would call alternative history. Now to be able to create this alternative history, the traditional ruler will be shopping for a public function. And after attending one like this, he will come to the assembly with a crown. Believing that he will be challenged. That was how, that was the, the, the crisis we had then. Many of them, in fact, they will make more beautiful crowns than that of the order of Ife. So they will come to the meeting. You see that the colonial masters will arrest them. Or the traditional ruler with bidder crown rise will report them to the colonial officials. And then they are arrested. And then when they are arrested, they will see the white man down and tell their own alternative history. So many of them told stories. And that is why we, want, we don't want to double into some of the conflicts we have now. Some of the traditional rulers now talking, we know more about their crimes than... So the question now is, do you release those documents? Because when you release those documents, you are creating more problems in the society. If a traditional ruler comes up to say, I am the most important person, probably by 1907, that man was still begging for recognition. This person is comparing himself now to other uh, kings. So, this conflict started and then several kings started coming to tell their stories. But, I will consider this to be the second layer of conflict we had during the colonial rule. The first major conflict was between the Oni of Ife and the Allah of Oyo. And the reason is that the first uh, uh, is it treaty or uh, treaty was signed with you know the Allah of for for your before coming to and the Oyo Yoruba was also adopted for writing the Bible and therefore the uh, the Allah of for your considered the Oyo to be the most important and therefore this revived the Afanja the Oranyan stories. Because you need those stories. The Allah of Yonfoya is still, celeb is still doing uh, Oronya and each time he's doing Oronya there is always a conflict with the with, with Ife. You know? So those, those things that the Allah of Yon, uh, you know, does every year they are deliberately done to keep to keep the issues alive and to say that we are more important than Ife people. And in fact I, I got into trouble about it about I think four years ago. When the Allah was doing Oronya, whatever, he, he asked me to come and I came. I'm like a son to him. He asked me to make a statement. And I and of course if 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 a traditional ruler of that prominence is asking you to make a statement, you must appreciate. But when the media reported it, the media reported it as if I went there as director of African studies to authenticate what the 
And so people call me from Ife. Well, why? What is your problem? <laughs> so it took me time before I could get, I could get uh, out of it. And I think three, four days ago, there was another drama at uh, Ife, and I'm sure you followed it, where they are laughing. The and you only had uh, now <coughs> when the so the first problem basically was Alafi and and uh, the only but when the bidet crown problem started the colonial masters referred all cases to the to the only and so a traditional ruler will come up create his own problem tell his story and then the story will be sent to Ife the only of Ife do you recognize this man? Is he recognized by and or he also arrogated to himself the right to decide whether the man is looking good or not looking good. We recognize this one, we don't recognize this one. And at a point in the debate, nineteen twenty three, the Alafin responded by saying that in your land you can say, Okay, you have three types of crown. You have the Adegidi, the, the, the original one. He said, you have the Yoriko Gofo. That is, you can have a traditional ruler who is just wearing cap and calling it or whatever. And then he said, you have what is called Ade Jakuja. <laughs> Probably you got it from if you're from. He was actually using that to dismiss the so-called... Uh, so, if what he was trying to say is that if the colonial masters is saying we recognize this man because all new fifa said so to the alafian for you is a day jakuja that means he got this thing from somewhere from nowhere so if you recognize him good but uh, what he's wearing is not is not better than orioko gufu you know so he tried to create that so we have two layers of conflict but the one that is sustaining the present problem is this be dead crown thing though you don't find the only of Ife talking about it, you don't find the Alafi talking about it. But the Bidet Crown dispute sustained sustained the debate. But what I want to bring out of it is that it forced several Yoruba leaders to start creating their own alternative history. And I pitied some of them because the documents I collected from public records office in London from National Archives showed that. Before the white man came, several of these bidet crown kings were not even interested in wearing any crown because nobody was, no use around them except the cultural, the rituals. You wear the bidet crowns probably when you are carrying out certain rituals. But when it became, it became fashionable, it became a source of power. Some of the kings that had already forgotten their own crowns had to go and look for them. Those who could not look for them made, created their own and I remember the case of Oshobo. Oshobo had a very big problem. The Ataojo had a very big problem and his own case took about eight years to, to, be, to be resolved. Now, in the 1940s, we created what we also call alternative history. Alternative history, but now which has become the dominant Yoruba history. What is that history? I will all wanted to bring everybody together because the Odudu thing is not as popular as it is. It was not as popular as it is now. I will all wanted to bring everybody together under the same political umbrella. And therefore, the myth of Odudu was revived colored up you know made more gal you know made more colorful and we therefore had a girl mode to so now that yoruba consciousness yeah that the consciousness of that identity was revived by everybody whereas in the past people were not too worried whether you are to do but he was able to bring everybody together and that was what produced what we refer to in Nigeria today as the Yoruba political identity. Whether it is openly accepted or not, the whole of Nigeria is aware that there is something called Yoruba political identity. I remember when APC was being formed some 
I met some northern Nigerian leaders and they asked me, they said, as a professor of conflict studies, what are your people looking for? We are working with them. But we know that Yoruba people don't, when they are going in any direction, they can see 10 years ahead of the rest of us. What, what, what have they seen and where are they going with us? So, but what is uniting us today is that Yoruba identity. Whether you go to the Caribbean, you go to America, all those places all over the world where the Yoruba identity is very strong. It is tied to uh, uh, Odudua. And that is why I use the word enemy guidedly just to support what we are saying here. What everybody that is against us tries to do is to knock that Yoruba identity. Because that Yoruba identity eventually came up to have the academic aspect, you know, a system that is making us to be very, very educated, that is making us to establish industries, that is making us to ex excel in sports. So all you need to do is to attack all these aspects to be able to whittle down that uh, uh, identity. And therefore, the crisis we had in the Southwest in the 1960s are written simplistically by political scientists as a political problem. It was a project. A project to whittle down, to whittle down a movement. A movement that could, if allowed, to spread across the Niger as Awolo was trying to do in the Middle Belt, could affect and change the mentality of everybody in Nigeria. So, the problems we had in the 1960s was not ordinarily political. Then, the 1979 transition and the experience of Awolo, then the June 12 crisis, um, and all these problems we've been having. You know, our people study them as, a pol as political problems. But, it's a project. They are all projects towards giving us a new uh, type of uh, identity. Now, my, what is the implication of this? The implication is that, is that the more alternative history you tell or you tolerate, the more divided you are as a people. And therefore, as we have more alternative history being provided for Yoruba people from outside and from within, the more uh, we, are, we are divided uh, as uh, a people. Now, we, I think I need to shorten it because I cannot just provide everything here. Uh, for now, Yoruba people are considered to be the ones teaching Igbo people about the restructuring. I have a number, I have a list of statements. You know, the Northerners pretend that, Yoruba, that Igbo people don't even, they pretend that they don't know what they want. Because when you find somebody saying, Igbo people don't listen to Yoruba people, that they are the ones pushing this structuring debate. It's as if Yoruba people don't know what themselves, what they want. But to me, if Yoruba people are pushing restructuring, it's a better alternative than secession, which I think other groups uh, uh, would, uh, are trying to press. Then you have the Yoruba people being presented as cowards, but when you look at the history of human rights activism and everything, you get the opposite. As, the, as you get the opposite. Since all the human rights activists in Yoruba land died, you know, nobody, no region has been able to generate, has been able to generate uh, bold, courageous people who can actually face the Nigerian state scientifically. Now, you also have some people describing Yoruba people as collaborators of uh, the Hausa Fulani and uh, so we, we, we have a number of a number of issues that uh, uh, 
we that we have to deal with few days ago i saw the map of odudua republic i don't know who drew that map <laughs> but the map included i mean odudua republic will include the present edo states and then worry in delta states and then under it i saw a comment let yoruba people be deceiving themselves now but the question is if we want an odudua republic where does it start and where does it end at the national conference some people from kwara state and kogi state came to us and i sympathize with them because when they came people were not even recognizing them at meetings so one of them said if we go to the meetings of the north they drive us away if we come to yoruba meetings you people drive us away that we, we are more comfortable working with you because you see the resolutions of the national conference you need context analysis people need to explain to you how we arrived at those funny at those funny uh, resolutions a prominent person came to us from the north you know those that you think are enjoying who are they said we constitute a minority we are Muslim, we are this, but we don't belong to this Aousa Fulani identity, but they have, you know, they have squeezed us in a way that we don't even have our own voice. Therefore, we want to participate in the discussion of minority groups, but you don't trust such people. Because this person I'm talking about is a very high profile person over there. But to, so to us here, we see them as part of the problem, but they said, look, we have our own problems. So, at the, at the conference, several issues came up. Where, who really are Yoruba people? If you take some people from Kwara State, if you take some people from Kogi State, how do you draw the, the map of... Now, we have some, as I try to conclude the paper, we have some contradictions and issues for us to discuss. When the Yoruba people had problems in the 1960s, it was with the North. It was a game of ensuring that Awolowo did not move too far with his revolutionary ideas. Awolowo suffered problems. He was, um, he was imprisoned. Nobody came to his rescue. Except the controversial debate. You know, uh, Ojuku said he was the person that released him. I mean, he's established Ujuku never released him. He was not the person that released him. He had all the time to release him, but he was not the person that released him. But Ujuku tried to claim, you know, he claimed it, that he was the person that released him. But Yoruba people never got any support from anybody until the man came out of prison. When Ibo were to secede, Awolawa came in with the pressure tactics of telling Nigeria if you allow these people to go, who will also go? It was, it's a pressure tactics to make federal government, you know, dialogue with Igbo speaking people. Today, Igbo people interpret it as an agreement. An agreement is when two sides sit down. If I make a statement here to say, if Kano is whatever, we will do, I will do this, that doesn't mean Yoruba people. Uh, actually it's a pressure tactics to make you force the federal government to but we have volumes of documents showing there was no agreement no meeting there was no meeting where but it is today said even in chino achebe's uh, book he wrote it down there that uh, yoruba people did not secede even when our went to juku to to tell him it is not a wise thing. You don't start this type of war and win it. He said, no, he will go on with it. But now it is said that Yoruba people ought to have also gone to war. People don't go into that type of senseless war because the war did not have the basic ingredients of... of, of, a, of a now, when Yoruba people were contending with the June 12 crisis, the Yoruba people did not see anybody. Yoruba people were abandoned. They were abandoned, but Yoruba people, intellectuals, said, this is going to be one war, you will fight, but no gun will be shot. And we're going to win this war. 
That is why Obasanjo became president in 1999, because the economy of Nigeria, everything was actually getting grounded. And there was no way. It is the, it, it is the formula of the 1994 transition in South Africa. The whites could no longer manage South Africa. That's why they, they gave it up in 1994. So, the people sat down. They did not actually threaten war. They did not actually, they went underground, did all they could, and they grounded the system. They, they ensured the system could not run. When Ebele Jonathan was prevented from becoming the president of Nigeria, the safe Nigeria movement is from Southwest. They all came out powerfully, forced the North to make that man to become president of Nigeria. The contributions of the other regions, including Niger Delta, was feeble. But when that government was formed, Yoruba people were thrown away. Now, when Jonathan was to be removed, he was not removed because he's a Niger Delta person. But Nigeria was failing under him. The movement started from the southwest. But when Buhari came to power, Yoruba people were thrown out. They were thrown out. Because that was a government that totally abandoned, uh, uh, managed, you know, abandoned Yoruba uh, people. Now, we are remaking history now. We are remaking history. And the history is that the people of the Southeast are saying they are tired of Nigeria, they want to go, they have the right to go. Federalism is not a call to slavery. If a system is not working for you, if obviously as we see, Igbo people are not benefiting sufficiently, but they benefited from certain governments, but now they are not benefiting. So federalism is saying we are only working together. So if you are working together, what stops you from saying we no longer want to work? And you say you must work by force. And you are not providing it. They have the right. They have the right to say they are going. Now, the people of the north, to me, they are pretending. The leaders, when you hear what the leaders say, is in harmony with the, what those Niger, with what those no outside uh, this thing no, the youth what they are saying because it's this, almost the same thing we don't want you if you want to go go so you don't find young kasai saying something go bola say one thing and then when some people call press conference they say no these people don't have our backing what you are saying is in tandem with what they have said so now the east is interested in going the north is saying go away that if you don't go we'll drive you away and I believe in the capacity of the two of them for evil. It's possible for them, it's possible for them to do what they promise to do. But Yoruba people now are up again. Few days ago there was a press conference here addressed by one of us who said an attack on one is an attack on all. We have started it again. So, Yoruba people are keeping quiet, uh, people are keeping quiet about this, outside people are keeping quiet. Then we came to Ibadan here to make, to call a press conference. Where we are saying, if you attack one Igbo man, you are attacking everybody in the south. Now, it is most likely that an Igbo person will be attacked. When, we are atta when they are attacked, what will Yoruba people do? Were you consulted before we made that statement? So, if you were not consulted before that statement was made, we are going back to the 60s where Awolowa said, if Igbo people are attacked, we Yoruba people too will respond. We are here to clean up that mess. We have started another one. <laughs> and this one is more dangerous because the two parties are determined. They are determined. Let's not, you see people say, these are young boys who never experienced civil war. To me, they are more important because all those old people taking money from government will soon die. And these young boys will talk over Igbo land. They are serious about what they are saying. And they have the right to say what they are saying. So, if you have two strong enemies saying we will be clashing, and then a foolish man comes in between them to say, to me, it's a very, very dangerous, it's a very, very dangerous, we are dragging Yoruba people into a problem that is not our own. But for this assembly, the question we want to ask ourselves, at what meeting did we decide that that is going to be our position? 
And I think this is where the issue of unity comes in. I'm not saying that if we had met that we couldn't have come to that conclusion. But if we didn't meet, you say it and you say Professor Albert should begin to throw stones once one person is killed, then I don't think you are fair to me. So this is the issue we are uh, calling attention to. Now, my recommendation is that we have to face the fact that Nigeria has a lot of problems. Yes, it might not be affecting us directly now, but there is a need for Yoruba people to sit down, to take a look at what is happening in our land. What do we do? If we want to assist our Igbo brothers, how do we assist them? If we want to appeal to the North or we want to assist them, what do we do? And why must we do whatever we choose to do? But I don't see anybody actually having any meeting, in including Don. Don, has not, Don cannot even call that meeting. Because if you call the meeting, only people, few people will come. Yeah. Not everybody will come. I've, I've, I've attended many Yoruba meetings. You see four people here today. Tomorrow you see four people here. You see four people here. And when each of them is concluding the meeting, they say, we Yoruba people have resolved. We are at which meeting? Whose authority are you using to drag Yoruba people's uh, name into? So, uh, the, the governors today are divided. They are not working together. OPC is factionalized. The traditional rulers are not in the same camp. We don't have somebody we can call a generally acceptable Yoruba leader. And we are not, we don't have an integrated uh, assembly. So we want to ask ourselves, what do we do? The things that united us in the past that could serve as a springboard for our unity have all been destroyed. They have all been destroyed as uh, the DG said at the beginning of... So we need to sit down to talk. And this returns me to the, to the issue of unity that we are talking about. Unity has to be, is about being together. The question is, are Yoruba people together? We are not together. Some are chasing money, some are chasing positions, some are chasing, uh, there are some Yoruba leaders you will meet. When you are expressing yourself, if what you are saying is not in tandem with their own objectives, they will just keep quiet. They will say, okay, we will just pray for Nigeria. <laughs> because they know that the road you are following is not the road that will lead to he wants to become governor and you are telling him about uh, whatever the man will just shake his head and say okay God will help us then this one is having contract before the person you are complaining about you say well let's keep praying for our land tomorrow you see him you know looking for money somewhere so we we are not we are not together so when we when I ask the question are we together we are not together the second is do we, are we thinking together? Can we think similarly? It is not possible under this uh, present situation. Can we act together? It is not possible. And then, are we ready to collectively bear the consequences of our action? For example, we have said now that if anything happens to any Southerner, Yoruba people will respond. Do we have the capacity to respond? Where is our army? Or who is going to throw the stone? Who is going to throw the stone? You know, now, what kind of unity should we be talking about? One, we need administrative unity. And the administrative unity of the past probably will not work for us now. When we went to the national conference, our elders presented to us uh, because we met and we said, okay, what are we Yoruba people bringing to the national conference? They said, they said regionalism. Lagos State was the first to say we don't want regionalism. You were, okay. We, are not, we don't want regionalism. And then other Yoruba people say we don't want to go back to Ibadan. So if all our leaders have been talking about is regionalism and regionalism, and even from within, there is no agreement on it. What is this newspaper nonsense people are actually promoting everywhere? Regionalism will not work because even you from within, you don't want it. So by the time we get, you know, left Yoruba meeting and interacted with other people, 
everybody is saying no we don't want to return to the regions so if we are not returning to the regions that means the administrative structure for our unity is not there we need to redefine it how do we want to work together luckily don is, is is a regional organization today but i don't know how many people how many how many of our people are really supporting don i think don depends largely on governors governors are politicians and so don might end up actually driving the political interest of some yoruba people that doesn't mean don is working for the region if we are truly interested in making don work for the region all of us will continue we bring our resources here to come and help this organization and then all of us we will define the objectives of done together and then run it modern politics is a problem we are in different political parties and even when we are in the same political parties we 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 don't belong to the same we don't have the same interest i was listening to a young man defining uh, or your politics and he, he, he discussed it in such a very dirty way he said these people are following lamb these people are following this person these people are following this and i say in the same within the same party you should be following you should you should have a common agenda he said no he said we have different names for ourselves within the party so if within the party you cannot even reach agreement it becomes a very very difficult uh, problem traditional rulers have their own problem of unity and then economic activities are considered in peace studies to be a source of cordial working relationship but all the economic structures we established that our lower established that our forefathers established we have destroyed them this building was burnt it was revived so everything that we forced all of us to work together destroyed our culture has been destroyed because, I mean, it is argued that if you want to destroy a people, start by destroying their culture. Not even my own children are ready for this uh, cultural thing you are talking about. They are not ready. I asked my daughter to wear traditional dress to my, uh, to my lecture. She came in jeans. I cannot kill her. <laughs> Every Christmas, I beg them. I say just for this day, well, they will take the clothes from you. But when you are going to church, they say, yeah, go, go, we'll come later. When you see them in the church, you are embarrassed, they are in jeans. So, we have been destroyed culturally. We have been destroyed culturally. Then, socially, our education is gone. Urbanization is destroyed. And our security is also destroyed. So the question is, what do we do? The first thing we need to do is to begin to reflect on how to build trust. How do we trust ourselves to be able to commonly define what, the, 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 what we work for Yoruba people? Because we first have to say this is what our people need. And then when we have agreed on what we need, we begin now to set the agenda as to uh, how to uh, achieve those goals. Who are we as a people as we contend with the problems of this country? What should be our position on national issues? What should be our position on local issues? What are the mechanisms for reaching conclusion? What do we do? This is the conversation and I want to invite all of us to join the conversation. Thank you so much.